All right, hello, my wonderful uh, viewers, all 21 of you. I have new content today, yeah. Um, about, I'm, it's literally, I'm just gonna be reading uh, this book that I got. It's called The Incas, a magical epic about a lost world. And I can't get the entire thing on here because my tripod doesn't allow for that, but you know, yeah. Um, here's the author. This guy, Daniel Peters, please don't copyright me. Um, I, I asked for his permission. He said, go for it. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, the Incas, here it is. So I, I've already read through this book twice. It's, it's a thousand and thousand something pages. Ah, here it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the glossary. Epilogue, joy. I think this might be left right here. 11037. Yay! Oh, oh that, that's for later. So anyways, um, as, as interesting as this covering is, uh, it's annoying when you're reading, and uh, I'm going to take it off. And oh, what's this? A secret message for YouTube. We'll be unboxing that later. Like, right after I take off this cover. Also, I kind of like the book without it. Yeah. Author's initials, and it's like nice, nice, nice uh, gold, gold thing, because Inca's had gold. And, uh, 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 yeah. So, also, secret message for YouTube. What? What could this possibly be? I don't know because I didn't write it. Okay, let's read it. I do not own or claim any of this as my work. Huh. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Alright, alright, you two. So uh, now that's done for. Um, yeah, let's open the book. 32 minutes. Whack. Okay, so here's the... The Inca Empire at its height, all basically all of the West, West South America, you know, ah, stupid hole. Um, uh, yeah, see, all way down, eh, way down, all down there. So, uh, uh yeah, it's North Miles. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, yeah. I should stop saying yes. Uh, alrighty then. Uh, Incas. These are his other books. The author is da Daniel Peter. Border Crossings, the Luck of Huamac, a novel about the Aztecs, who I think lived in Mexico, and Tikal, a novel about the Maya, who I think lived in Peru, or Central America, somewhere down there. Um, yeah, I don't know about, much about the Mayans, but uh, uh, yeah. Now, uh, yeah, Incas again. And, uh, oh wait. Eh, title card. Yeah, Incas, Daniel Peters, novel. Don't copyright me. Um, this is the copyright by him. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that. I'm, I'm not gonna read that. It's, oh, look, it's first edition. Fun. Uh, to Gary. I don't know who Gary is. Also this. All of this. This is a acknowledgement. I do not read these, usually. Um, I read a couple of these, like Guides in Bolivia, Wife, uh, Agents, Friends and Readers, Libraries, Universities, uh, the Experts on the, the Scholarly Sources. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, let's move on. Our contents. Yeah, so don't look at any of that. It's just just that first one. That's all we're reading. And, uh, glossaries of, I think, Quecha. I think that's, it's Quecha or Quecha. Terms of, terms of the characters of the gods of the place and tribes to be found in the back of this book. Um, yeah, there we are. You guys can see. These are the, there, there were 12 Sapa Inca. Uh, the Sapa Inca is the sole lord, the, he based the king of the Incas. Um, uh, yeah, this, this is where we're starting, this guy, 
Why in the kapak? Um, yeah. Uh, spoilers. No, no need to look at any of. I mean, hey, look, city. Pointer. Points. Points. Cusco Western Road. Fun. Um. Uh. uh no, no, don't worry. Ah, there. Yes. Bookstore. I'm gonna sit down now. Um. Ah. Okay. Joy. Okay, so Pachacuti, the world turned upside down, AD 1511. Fun. Get my water. And let's start. On this day, Juan the Capac, the 11th Sapa Inca, the sole lord of the Four Quarters, was departing from Cusco. He had called up an army of warriors from all parts of the Four Quarters over 100,000 men to help him wage war upon the Quitos and the Carangui, who had destroyed the Inca garrisons on the frontier north of Tumibamba. It was the young ruler's first extended military campaign, and he was taking his entire court and most of his wives with him. Along with his top administrators and their families, and a large group of artisans, stonemasons, and builders, Cusco had been in a frenzy of preparation for months, and... Now the great exodus of the Incas was finally about to begin. See the bottom? Right? Yeah. Be good. In a short while, in the great square called Jauquepata, the most illustrious of the Inca warriors, the Old Guard, would begin forming their ranks with their fringed shields and battle, battle standards in their hands, their heavy gold their heavy golden earplugs mirroring the light of the sun. The other Incas of the blood would file out onto the terraces in front of the palaces of the past rulers, with those of, the upper, with those of upper Cusco on the northern side of the square and those of lower Cusco to the south. The Sapa Incas litter, wreathed in gold and feathers and covered with finely embroidered gauze curtains, would, have, would already have been brought out by the Rukana bearers, who would carry him and the Koya north to Tumibamba, having, com to tum ah, sorry. having completed their prayers and offerings, the sun priests would be standing in a group around the sacred Napa, the spotless white llama who, hold on, page turning, would, leave, would lead the procession out of Cusco. Men wearing the blue livery of palace servants would be leaving the square at its northwest corner, sweeping the ground as they went with grass brooms, clearing the northern quarter road over which the Sapa Inca would pass. At the proper time, Huayna Capac himself, the sole lord, shepherd of the sun, would emerge from his palace, the Amarucancha, and walk toward the enormous stone dais that stood in the center of the square. Kuzi Aqui saw none of this with his eyes, for there were no openings in the thick stone walls of the House of Learning, and the boys were made to sit with their backs to the single doorway. Nor could he truly hear the muted shuffle of the crowd's sandaled feet, for any sound from the outside was drowned by the boys' chanting recitations, which they spoke in unison, their fingers running over the knots of the memory cords spread, spread out onto the floor in front of them. Even as he imagined the scene in the square, Kuzi did likewise. His mouth. Oh, sorry about that. Kuzi did likewise. His mouth and fingers possessing their own memories, independent of his attention. Yet he knew that it was wrong to let his thoughts wander when the legend of Viracocha's journey was being remembered aloud. He had been reminded many times by the teachers that his participation should not be half-hearted, no matter how easily the words came to his tongue. Remembering was not simply his personal gift, but a serious form of devotion, necessary to the well-being of Cusco and the Incas. But only one verse later, Cusi let his eyes stray sideways to his friend, Rimachi. Rimachi was a Cañara from Tumibamba, and his father, a member of the Royal Guard, was accompanying the Sapa Inca north. Most of Ramachi's family was going with him, but Ramachi himself, like Kuzi, was being left behind in Cusco. He was bent over his cords with a frown of concentration on his face, doing his best to resist the thoughts that threatened to pull him away. 
Kuzi guiltily returned his attention to the recitation. Still, he was aware of his other two friends to his right, Uritu, struggling as always over his court, Tomei sitting upright with his eyes on the teacher at the front, displaying the completeness of his involvement. Both were the sons of provincial chiefs and were accustomed to being separated from their families, so the departure of the Incas did not affect them as directly as it did Kuzi and Ramachi. Kuzi's fingers found the last pendant's cord and his voice rose automatically along with those of the other boys. They had come to the last verses of the legend. Viracocha and the two helpers he had created out of himself had traveled the length of the land from Titicaca to the far north. One had gone along the coast of Mamacocha, the mother water, another through the rugged jungle lands east of the Andes Mountains, and Viracocha himself along the high plateau between the mountain ranges. In each place, the Viracochas had brought the people forth from their caves in the earth and had given them the means to live and the understanding of how they must live. Huh. Now Viracocha would depart over the waters to the north, leaving his creation behind. Kuzi joined the final verse with his whole heart. Can that be seen? It can. Good. None were left to summon, none to animate and succor. All men stood upon the earth, all in their places of origin. Now he would leave them, now he would return, to Mamakocha, to the great foaming waters from which he sprang. Tiki Viracocha Pachayachachik. He who knows the earth, Tiki Viracocha Pachayachachik. He who disposes of all things. The boys sat upright in the conclusion of the chant, their backs straight and their eyes upon the gray-haired old man who sat at their head. But the teacher did not comment on their performance or give any sign that he was ready to dismiss them. He knows which of us have farewells to make, Kuzi thought, resisting the urge to glance at Ramachi. This was the patience and demeanor the educators had been trying to teach the boys since their first day in the house of learning, the demeanor of the Inca, who displayed none of the impatient impulses of his heart, no matter what the circumstances. The legend of Viracocha's departure had, of course, been chosen deliberately in order to make those impulses even harder to control, at least for the boys whose families were leaving. Leave me now in an orderly fashion, the teacher said finally, his admonition causing most of the boys to sit for an additional moment before they began to wrap their cords into tight conical bundles and rise from their places. Kuzi forced himself to move with the same deliberateness as Ramachi, who was in turn using Kuzi as his standard of orderliness. As a result, Uritu and Tomei got through the doorway ahead of them and were waiting in the narrow cobblestone street outside the compound. The street was crowded with the warriors, officials, and all manner of porters, some leading strings of pack llamas, some leading strings of pack llamas. You will be in Haukaipata later? Kuzi asked Ramachi as the four of them huddled in a tight group outside the doorway. Rimachi adjusted the wickerwork band around his head and nodded with his usual assurance. Not in my customary place, though. My father is with the Sapa Inca's litter, so I will stand in the back with the families of the guard. I will find you when it is over, Kuzi promised, and he turned inquisitively towards you, Uritu and Tomei. Uritu just showed, shrugged and shook his head, but Tomei pursed his cheek lips resentfully and swallowed before speaking. The high color in his fleshy cheeks made Kuzi sorry he had asked. I have to leave Kuzco immediately, Tomei said in a flat voice, his eyes going past Kuzi. A moment of embarrassed silence ensued. Tomei was a cola from Hatun Kola, and the colas had rebelled against the Incas too many times, ever to be fully trusted. Only 1,000 of them were allowed to be in the Cusco at any one time which meant on a day as important as this that some would have to leave before any more could enter for the departure ceremonies. I will walk to the turning with you, Ramachi proposed abruptly, rescuing them all from their embarrassment by leading Tumei off down the street. Kuzi and Uritu turned to walk east, their wrapped cords in their hands, their slow pace dictated by the crowd in the streets and their proximity to the sacred hearts of Cusco. They did not speak of the shame Tomei had to bear on behalf of his people, since it was a matter of law and beyond questioning. Of the four of them, Kuzi was the only Inca of the blood, with full rights to Cusco. 
You will be living in your uncle's compound after today, Ritu suggested as they walked, and Kuzi nodded with enthusiasm. He has given me the room that used to belong to his eldest son. He has always treated me more like a son than a nephew. You will be close to my father's compound. You must come and visit with me more often. And you must come and eat with me and Loki Yupanki, Kuzi said, distractedly, realizing how far they had come. The broad street in front of them was Chokwi Chaka, the street that covered the Tulu River. There was, an openings, there was openings in the pavement down and middle of the street, providing a continuous glimpse of the shiny water rushing through the channel below. Ritu suddenly gestured with the rolled cord in his hand. You want to spend this time with your family. You can go faster without me. Kuzi smiled at him, grateful for his understanding. Ritu was a camper from the eastern corner, Quarter, and it was not permitted to him to run through the streets of Cusco. An Inca boy like Kuzi, however, might be forgiven such disrespect on a day like this. The Campa do not believe in farewells, do they? Kuzi asked, glancing at the thin lines tattooed across Uritu's cheeks and the spray of blue-green feathers that hung from his leather headband. Uritu replied with his customary frankness, his face grave with received wisdom. No. We, fe we feel you might keep some of the departing person's spirit behind with you and make them weak. But it makes you strong to remember the faces of those who love you. It makes you less lonely. We do not forget, but we prefer... Eh, prefer... <laughs> but we prefer to remember the person as he was, here, not as a person who is leaving. U Uritu spread his hands, apologizing for his insistence. But Kuzi just laughed and gave him a playful poke. I will not say farewell then, but I will see you tomorrow, he promised. Edging out into the street as the last of the line of pack llamas passed, bobbing their heads and bumping one another from behind. Uritu simply nodded, his broad, tattooed face impassive as if he were already alone and could not be affected by Kuzi's desertion. Okay. Next page. Oh, actually, never mind. I need to take a drink. <sighs> Clutching his cord against his chest, Kuzi broke out into a trot and ran off down the street, picking up speed even as he wove his way through the people in front of him. He jumped over one of the open stretches of water in the center of the street, then jumped back again to avoid a column of warriors who had just come around the corner of one of the compounds. He turned left onto the steep, narrow street called Hat Hatun Rumiyok, which climbed the hill in terrace segments like a giant set of stairs. By habit, Kuzi adopted a measured gait, taking four strides to cross each terrace before leaping up to the next. The street was lined with the walled compounds of the Incas of the Blood, and through every open doorway he could see porters, llamas, and servants milling about in the courtyard within, surrounded by piles of bags and bundles. Cusco was going to seem empty tomorrow when all these people had departed. His parents would be gone then too, along with his brother and sister and most of his uncles and cousins. He knew he would miss them greatly, especially his mother and sister. But still, he had his friends and his uncle Loki Yupanki, who had done more to raise him than Kuzi's own father. And he would be joining his family soon enough, after he had completed the manhood rites and his training as a warrior. The Incas might even be marching back to Cusco by then, to celebrate a swift victory over the Quitos and the Karangui. In any event, Kuzi was determined to show that he was not hurt or upset at being left behind. He had already rehearsed in his mind what he would say to his mother to convince her not to worry, and to soothe her sorrow at their parting. He would make her feel as confident about his future as he felt himself. Near the top of the hill, Kuzi turned in through the tall trapezoidal doorway that was the only entrance to his fa family's compound. Within the walled enclosure, ranged around a small, central courtyard, were four stone houses, each with a single entrance and a steeply pitched roof thatched with thick, woven layers of grey and yellow ichu grass. At the far end of the courtyard, set upon a platform that compensated for the slope of the hill, was an open-sided awning house that was used as a kitchen and a storage area. The head of the family servants, Runtukaya, was inside the awning house, giving orders to a group of porters. One of the porters' llamas had strayed to the edge of the platform and was nibbling on the plants in the flower bed that lined the base of the retaining wall. The llama raised his head briefly as Kuzi entered the courtyard 
and then went back to his eating. Let him eat, Kuzi thought. There would, be, there would soon be no one here to tend the garden. Huh. He had just turned towards his mother. Wait. Yeah, I can't see the bottom. Great. He had just tur turned toward his mother's house when his sister, Quinty Oclo, came through the curtain doorway, holding up her palm to make him stay where he was. She was already wearing her traveling cloak around her shoulders, and her shift was loosely belted at the waist for walking. Kuzi smiled as she came up, but Quinty only bared her teeth and gave her head a slight shake, letting him know that this was no time for smiles. She was three years older than Kuzi and still a whole hand taller, so he had to look up to meet her eyes. Father wants to see you, she told him in a voice that was raspy with... With what? With tension. Uh, yeah, there we go. Kuzi recognized the voice and drew back a little, since she was learning, leaning over him protectively. Is he angry with me? He's angry with everyone. He learned today that he will not be going to Tumibamba as the Mitra of the province, as the Mitra of the province, not the governor as he wished. That should not make him angry with me. He also learned that Loki Yupanki had been named as one of Huayna Kapak's royal remembers and will be going north with us. After all, he had to find with us no eh, and will be going north with us after all he had to find another guardian for you loki is leaving too kuzi murmured in dismay then he realized how childish he must sound and tried to speak briskly mother will be pleased to have her brother with her at least quinty shook her head the same way she had when he had smiled at her though with a bit more exasperation she has not made a secret of her pleasure nor father of his displeasure be warned, Kuzi, do not let him hurt you with what he says. I will come and see you and mother afterward, Kuzi said bravely, but Quinty simply stared at him as if memorizing his face until he turned and headed for his father's house. He went through the open doorway without hesitation, trying to gain some strength from the certainty of his movement. Light poured into the large single room from the windows at both ends, and the two that flanked the doorway, the walls, and... Eh. In the large single room from the windows at both ends and the two that flanked the doorway. The walls had been stripped of the helmets, shields, and cloth hangings that had formerly decorated them, making the room seem hollow and barren. Apupoma was sitting was standing near one of the niches in the back wall, dipping lime from a wooden container while conversing with Kuzi's older brother, Amaru. They were both good sized men, dressed in tunics and breech clothes of fine kumbai cloth. Fringe, fringed bands of red cloth around their knees and ankles. Kuzi felt small in their presence and inclined his head respectfully, coming to a halt beside Amaru, his brother, who would be going north in the company of the other Inca warriors. He gave him a smile that seemed strained and then surprised him by laying an affectionate arm over his so shoulders. The heavy round earplug fixed in the stretched lobe of Amaru's ear dangled briefly within Kuzi's vision its golden surface glinting in the light of the d from the doorway. Their father's reaction was swift and harsh. Leave him be, he's too used to kindness as it is. Amaru's, voice, Amaru's handsome face sobered abruptly and he removed his arm and took a step backward, making Kuzi feel small and exposed again. Apupama dipped his silver spatula into the carved container in his hand and lifted a rounded heap of grayish powder to his lips. Oh no, was I? Ah, I was reading out. My bad. So, uh, I'm down here. Okay. So, Apu Palma dipped his silver spatula into the carved container in his hands and lifted a round heap of grayish powder to his lips, adding lime to the quid of coca that was already bulging in his cheek. He chewed for a moment, making sucking sounds and reducing the bulge in his cheek. He always chewed coca when he was upset, and it always seemed to make him additionally impatient, so that Kuzi thought of coca as the fuel for his anger. Apupoma spoke abruptly out of one side of his mouth. Loki Yupanki has relinquished his, respons his responsibility as your guardian. I spent most of the morning searching for a replacement. It was not easy to find someone who would sponsor a boy of your age and size. You are fourteen. With only one year left before your initiation group will undergo, undergo the Huara Chikoy. How could I assure someone that you will be fit for the rites when you are still so small and weak? I have grown a hand, 
half a hand in the last year, Kuzi said tightly, reminding himself that he had heard this from his father before. And I am the fastest runner in our group, he added more forcefully, faster even than Tomei and the other boys from the high plain. Out of the corner of his eye, Kuzi thought he saw Amaru smile at his boast. Apupoma rubbed his chin as if considering the merits of what he had just heard. Then his arm shot out and the flat of his hand struck Kuzi on the breastbone, knocking him to the floor. What good is your swiftness now? he demanded. Would you be the first one to the enemy, only to have him slaughter you? Stand up. Trembling with shock, Kuzi scrambled to his feet. Amaru had stepped forward with the hand raised as if to intervene, but Apupoma waved him back with a stern gesture. You are not a participant in this conversation. Attend us in silence or leave. Nostrils flaring, Amaru stepped back but did not leave. Kuzi fought to hold himself still, since the sudden fall had jarred him from the base of his spine to the top of his head. Apupoma seemed to loom over him, making him arch his neck to meet his father's eyes. Uh, okay, just barely, so let's just move this up. I spoke to some of the warriors in charge of your training. They think that you lack the desire to dominate your opponent in the drills. They say that you are immature and more interested in keeping the friendship of the other boys than improving your own worth. Immature? Kuzi echoed blankly, unable to recall ever being reprimanded for that by the warriors. Sumal Sumak Malqui has said that I was immature? It does not matter who said it. I can see it for myself. You do not command respect as an Inca should and must. You try to ingratiate yourself with smiles and kindness, like a woman. Kuzi was too stunned to speak. How could the warriors have regarded him with such contempt and not shown it to him? How could he have missed it if they had? You pretend that you do not know this about yourself, Apupoma said scornfully. That, that only made it more difficult to find a suitable guardian, one who could bear, break you of your delusions. In desperation, I was forced to go to Ataranko Achachi and plead with him to do me this favor. He has consented. Uh, oh yeah, right here. Kuzi repressed a shiver of apprehension. Atranko Achachi was his father's uncle and Kuzi's most famous living relative, the conqueror of the Eastern Quarter. Kuzi had met him only once and remembered a scarred face and a jeweled uh, ah, there we are. and a jeweled cup made from a human skull. He had not known that his, that his father was close enough to Atranko Achachi to ask him such a favor. That is a great honor, he whispered. Perhaps it will inspire you to grow, Apu Pama suggested, with a pointed lack of, conv of conviction. Oh, I read that wrong. It'd be like that. Because if you have not grown sufficiently by the time of the next year's rites, the teachers will keep you in the house of learning for another year, at my instruction. There is no point in risking the disgrace of failure. A Taranko Achachi will be the judge of your readiness. Kuzi felt as if, as if he had been knocked to the floor for a second time, though this time it gave him a voice. But I will be separated from my initiation brothers if I am held back. We have done everything together for three years, and we are meant to be friends and allies for as long as we live. I have no such friends among the boys who come behind us. An Inca who can command respect needs no friends. He can go anywhere if he is sent, and live alone if he must. I had no friends with me when I commanded the garrison at Copiapo, and if you need friends so badly, it is better that you make them among Huascar and his brothers than among the sons of Chuncho savages and Kola traitors. Okay, uh, can you... Where was it? Uh, eh. There we are. Apupoma had belittled Kuzi's friends before, and in similar terms, but this suggestion made no sense. Huascar was the heir of the Sapa Inca, and he had no friends except his brothers. His guards would not allow anyone else to come near him. Besides, Kuzi would never trade the friendship of Uritu, Ramachi, and Tomei for that of anyone else, however important in blood. If his father did not understand that, there was no way to reason with him. Kuzi would simply have to grow and make himself strong so that Atranko Achachi would find him ready. I have heard you and taken your words into my heart, he said in, de in a determined voice. Do I have your permission to visit with Mama Kori and Quinty Oklo now? No, Abu Poma said flatly. That is another attachment you must break if you are ever to become a man. You will see them again when you wear the earplugs of an Inca warrior, not before. 
Kuzi stood stiffly, frozen in confusion. Was he supposed to ignore his mother's departure, as if it were not happening? Where was he supposed to hide himself so he would not be seen? I do not understand what I am to do. I want you to leave this room and go directly to the Huaka to which you were pledged as an infant. Make an offering and ask for the strength to become a man, so that you might come to Tumibamba and see your mother again. I have already sent word to the guards at the bridge to let you pass out of the city. But the departure ceremonies will be over before I can return, Kuzi said in a hollow voice, resisting comprehension. You will all be gone. An ink is often separated from those he loves, often without warning. Farewells are an indulgence that will only make you weaker. Apropoma reached back into the niche and brought forth a small woolen bag. Your mother has agreed that this is best. She has provided you with these coca leaves as an offering to the Huaka. Kuz realized that he was still holding his cord, and he transferred it back to his and he transferred it to his left hand before reaching out for the bag. It was extremely light and crackled slightly between his fingers. He looked up at his father, disbelieving him for the first time. His mother would never have agreed that this was best for him. Even if, even if she had been forced to accede to Apupoma's wishes, she would never have denied him a proper farewell. Not even as a punishment. Go, Apupoma said. You have seen enough of me as well. Kuzi glanced once at Amaru, who was standing like a piece of stone, his eyes glazed and unseeing. Then he had turned abruptly and walked out of the room, carrying the offering in one hand and the cord in the other. He walked halfway across the courtyard before he stopped. He had never disobeyed a command in his life, at least not intentionally. But he had never received one that seemed so cruel and unjust. It might be years before he would see his mother again. If he could only have a look a parting gesture to remember her by. From behind him, he heard Amaru's voice, loud and angry, then his father's, then Amaru's again, even louder. They were arguing. This is all wrong, Kuzi thought, not, not wishing to hear what they were shouting at each other. This was not a day to be exchanging harsh words and harsh and angry words, especially not between fathers and sons. He tried to turn his body towards his mother's room, but the sight of the woolen bag in his hand arrested him in mid-motion. He could not go to her with her own offering in his hand, defiling it with his disobedience. She had permitted him many liberties as a child, but disobedience had never been one of them. She would not expect to see him, and she would not wish to, to now that Apupoma has forbidden it. Curling his fingers around the bag and the cord, he forced himself to begin moving towards the compound entrance. He had been told many times that a man who obeyed no one was a savage, doomed to live in arrogance and confusion, never knowing his proper place in the world. Yet at this moment, he felt that way himself, and he had not dis disobeyed anyone. The feeling was even worse than he had imagined, a fearful sense of uncertainty that seemed to hollow him out from within. Yet even in his confusion, his instinct was still to obey, so he kept on walking, putting one foot in front of the other, leaving his father's compound without looking back. And that's where we'll be stopping for now. So, uh, yikes. Already, this, this video is probably going to be like 36-ish minutes long. So, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the book. Um, if this video gets... A grand three likes. I will be continuing with the next part. Um, hold on. I need to bookmark it. Uh, yeah, there we are. Bookmark. So, uh, yeah. So, again, I hope you guys enjoyed. And if I get three, three likes, I will do another part. And um, also, I realized that uh, my voice was kind of whack. And I wasn't reading the words properly with the, the dialogue and all that. And I was uh, missing commas and such before I started reading. And uh, I think I corrected it towards the end, but I don't know. So anyways, I hope you liked it. Uh, hit the like button. Like I said, three likes. Next part. Um, subscribe if you want more con. Oh, well, I guess you could go look at my other con. I mainly do Dragon Ball, but uh, yeah. Uh, have a nice day. Goodbye.